Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Available on Apple Podcasts and Podcast One. Time and place is everything, especially in marketing. But in today's age of a million messages per minute and not enough hours in a day, how do you really catch your target audience's attention? Fortunately, there's a simple way. LinkedIn can help you speak to the right people at the right time. With LinkedIn becoming number one in B2B display advertising in the U.S., you've got a great advantage. You can stand out against your competitors while nurturing customer relationships and growing your brand. LinkedIn delivers you quantity and quality. Its targeting tools allow you to reach your precise audience down to their job type company name, location, and more, which means your ads are being seen by those who matter. So it's no wonder companies of all sizes and sectors are using it. Take Main Street, a company who helps venture-backed startups claim tax credits. They increase their annual recurring revenue by $12 million with LinkedIn's marketing solutions. Scale your marketing and grow your business with LinkedIn advertising. As a thank you to their customers for helping them grow three times faster than the competition, LinkedIn is offering a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to LinkedIn.com slash marketing to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash marketing. Progressive presents Forest Metaphors about bundling your home and auto. In sports, three goals is a hat trick. And when you bundle your home and auto with Progressive, you get a hat trick of great savings and round-the-clock protection. So you might be thinking, wait, that's two things. A hat trick is three. But in this metaphor, great savings counts as two goals, and so does round-the-clock protection. So it's like four goals, and that's more than three. It's basic math. Forced Metaphors, presented by Progressive. Bundle and protect today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discount not available in all states or situations. Podcast One presents Fully Booked by Kirkus Reviews. The ultimate insider's scoop on the best new books. Every week, Kirkus brings you author interviews, recommendations from the bestseller lists, and insights into books that are not yet on your radar. Hi, I'm Megan Labrice, editor-at-large of Kirkus Reviews. Welcome to another episode of Fully Booked. Thank you so much for joining us. My guest today is Sarah Graham, author of the new novel, The Book of the Most Precious Substance, out now from Dreamland Books. Now, this is an exciting one for a whole holy host of reasons, but let me give you three of them. One, if you already know Sarah Gran, who is the author of seven previous novels, including Come Closer and a mystery series starring world's greatest P.I. Claire DeWitt, you're probably a big Sarah Gran fan. Gran is a writer's writer, and her fans are numerous and passionate, and I now count myself among them. Two, this new novel, The Book of the Most Precious Substance, is one of the most delightful, surprising books I've been able to get my hands on lately. It's an erotic literary thriller that tells the story of a brilliant woman, a writer's writer, by the way, who puts her literary career on hold when her husband falls ill with a mysterious, incapacitating illness. She, Lily, becomes a caregiver, and to support the family, she deals rare books. The excitement of this novel kicks off when a fellow rare books dealer mentions he might have a buyer for an incredibly rare 17th century sex magic manual. And he is promptly murdered. This sends Lily on a quest to find the sex magic book and the buyer, with the help of another colleague. And last but not least, reason number three, the book of the most precious substance is the first title out from an exciting new publisher. Dreamland Books promises to publish books of outstanding quality in beautiful packages and give its authors more creative and financial control over their work. The founder of this exciting new publisher is Sarah Gran. After the break, Sarah Gran joins us from Los Angeles to discuss the book of the most precious substance, Dreamland Books, and much, much more. Writer Janine Olette is the author of The Part That Burns, a memoir and essays about her painful experiences in childhood and adulthood. Our review called it, quote, a textured remembrance of a traumatic childhood that also offers affecting moments of beauty, end quote. It was one of Kirkus Indy's best books of 2021, and in this sponsored interview, we'll talk to Janine about her book. My name is Amelia, and I work in the indie department. Hi, Janine. Thank you so much for joining us on Fully Booked. Hi, Amelia. Thank you for having me. 
It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm really excited to dig into your memoir, The Part That Burns, which was one of our best indie books of 2021. You've had a long writing career already before the book came out, including journalism, education writing. Can you tell me a little bit about how that background informed how you approached writing this book? Grateful for that long background with a wide variety of different kinds of writing, which that's not really past tense because my day job is with the University of Minnesota School of Public Health as a writer. I assist faculty with grant proposals, uh, academic journal articles, and conduct narrative medicine forums for the general public and also health researchers and health writers and uh, medical providers. You know, it's all helpful. It's all valuable. And I feel like working with writing in an academic or technical setting and the emphasis on on brevity has been the most helpful of all. The book, there's a lot in there considering that it's not very long. What was that like for you to kind of bring all these different parts of your life together in one narrative? You know, I mean, it was a challenging book to write. It deals with some pretty sensitive topics. Um, And, you know, particularly I think when we're dealing with um, traumatic things in childhood, you know, that's, that can be difficult for people to read and that raises the stakes on the writing. One of the things that I did to, to bring the book together was approach it through a pretty experimental lens in terms of the writing process. And I used a lot of inventive writing constraints that required a lot of puzzling to make it work within whatever the constraint was demanding, which the chapter called Tumbleweeds, I used um, botanical facts about the tumbleweed. Um, In another section, I used dogs as a device. So four dogs, maybe five, you know, was constructed around the different dogs that my family had as pets, even though it wasn't really about dogs. There was a playfulness, I feel like, in some of that um, puzzling that helps bring a levity, I hope, and a light. And I feel like that the feedback has been that it that it did. What are your hopes for readers who come to your story, whether they have a personal connection uh, or not? Writing is about giving people an experience of being less alone, no matter whether they've experienced something similar. We have this collective humanity and we all we all know grief, you know, we all know fear. We all know sorrow and we all know ecstasy and hope. So I feel like if we can render personal experience with enough specificity to let that create for someone else that feeling of, you know, what it really means to be human, um, then then the work has served a purpose. Is there anything that anything that maybe hasn't come up in past interviews that you feel like is important for uh, listeners of Fully Booked to know about the part that burns? In terms of the part that burns, I really feel like it's a book that speaks to mothers and motherhood and that doesn't get talked about as much you know as other aspects of the book but I know that's true so I would want to put that out there thank you so much Janine for your time for joining me on fully book if you're just joining us on the podcast you can find the part that burns online at amazon and split lip press Welcome, Sarah, to Fully Booked. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. As I said just before we started rolling, thank you for this exquisite, horny book. <laughs> thank you so much. That that was basically what I wanted to hear when I wrote it. So thanks. That's perfect. <laughs> this was this. I would call this a reader's book, uh, the book of the most precious substance. What would you like our readers to know about it? It is a thriller about someone in search of a rare book that promises unlimited power through sex magic. Very good. Yes, you're getting it. Okay, that's the nug. Why don't we start with telling everybody a little bit more, if you would, about Lily Albrecht, who she was, who she is, who she may be. You know, what's what's what makes this character tick? Sure, I'd love to. Um, so Lily is the main character in the book. She is a formal a former novelist who is now a rare book dealer. And over the first couple of chapters, we find out why she had this big shift in life and why she has not written another book after her first very successful novel, which is her husband, Abel, has been uh, stricken by a rare disease. He is utterly incapacitated. And she is both too depressed uh, and too in need of quick money to keep writing. So she has moved them both to a quiet, safe town and has sort of resigned herself to this somewhat shitty life of of selling rare books and continually trying to get her husband better. 
And then along comes an offer in her rare book dealings to find a book called The Book of the Most Precious Substance, which is a book about sex magic, which is very rare if it exists at all. There might be no copies. There might be just a couple copies in the world. But she has heard that someone will offer a million dollars for that book. So her and her friend Lucas go off to find it. How do you regard thrillers in general? What do you think about them? It's hard because usually I'm more of like a horror writer or a crime mystery writer. And so I'm somewhat arbitrarily calling this a thriller because I didn't (laughs) quite know what else to call it. It's it's not a, a, I could talk for hours about the definition of like what's a detective novel or what's a horror novel. The definition of a thriller I will leave to to smarter people. Um, To me, it was just like, it's a bit of a quest structure. It's a structure in this particular book where they're going after something, they're going to find it, but there is no mystery to solve. It is about going after something and hopefully has kind of a a fun pace to keep you engaged. I really, uh, a couple of years ago, I wanted to read something. I was like, I want to read a light book. I want to read something that's fun and well-written, but that is going to pull me through, that is going to be compelling because I am busy and often depressed. And I just want to read something <laughs> that's going to suck me right in. And I couldn't find it. So, so that was kind of why I wrote this book. So I think that falls under the thriller category, but I am open to arguments for sure. Well, this book did that for me. I'm interested in quest structure and stop me if I start to bore you, but here's a little bit of nerding out. Okay. So there's something that you do, I felt as a reader, rather consistently through this book as far as dispensing information. Sometimes you give enough information about like a town, say, 115 miles north of New York City, a few miles east of the river. It's like that's something you could you could pursue that. It's meaty enough that you could do a little Googling, your fingers could walk, and you could maybe find out maybe what this town is. You know, there, it's also with like Abel's parents' religion, and there are vaguely some children's books mentioned in here, one of which I believe was Charlotte's Web. The effect for me was it it made me like it made me want to pursue those lines and and confirm my suspicions and i was wondering kind of how this was what how, what this was lending to the propulsion of the narrative uh, that's interesting it was not really an intentional choice so much yeah. as i think as a writer i always try to sort of hit that note in between too specific and too vague because Hmm. if you get really specific you get into the trouble of well that's not where the grocery store is pardon me (laughs) yeah that's there is no ice cream shop on that corner which can be a big distraction and then if you go in a totally imaginary place in an otherwise pretty grounded book uh that also leads to the same kind of distraction so for me especially in this particular book which again was not a mystery so i didn't really it's cool that you found clues to what to look for but it wasn't necessary to sort of lay in clues Um, it was about the reading experience, about how can I just sort of give the person enough information to keep going and not enough information to bog them down or distract them. It's interesting. I think I've just been a little, had a little bit of a heightened sensitivity to this lately because I also just interviewed John Darnielle about Devil House. Mm -hmm. And in that one, I don't know if you've had a chance to read that one. No, I'm looking forward to it though. I'm excited. It looks right up my alley. Oh, it is. You're going (laughs) to love it. But one thing he does, and I talked with him about this, is he intentionally changes some detail. There's like an intentional fuzziness of certain details. Like for instance, you don't know if the narrator owns or rents the house. And I was like, am I just, am I catching something you didn't intend? Am I seeing something weird? He's like, no. He's like, I wanted it that way. And it did, you know, it's about, it's contending with true crime and storytelling and details and air quotes facts. And so I kind of liked thinking about it more through that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I said, it's just for me about that reader experience and how yeah. do you sort of keep the person going. But then in other books, I've used that to more or greater effect. Like in, I wrote a horror book, Come Closer, in 2003 that that uh, thankfully people still read, at least sometimes. And, um, <laughs> you know, with that, it's in a city and I never named the city. And that was a very intentional decision because I wanted to have that sense of it could be anywhere. It could be happening to anybody Um, And then in my other books, my detective series that I write, I'm always very specific about place because a big part of the book is about this person traveling around America and kind of what they find there. So then I always want to be very accurate. Lily travels all over the world in this book with a companion and the locations are believable and the food sounds great. 
Good, good. Thank you. I got a lot of compliments on the food so far, which was um, uh, uh, nice and very new for me because usually my characters are sort of like having a burger in a coffee shop. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, the food was a big part of this character. Uh, As I said before, she gets this lead on a a very valuable rare book and goes to find it. And through the course of doing that, she really comes back to life after having been sunk in this depression for many, many years now. And part of that is sort of that she has people around her who can pay for good food of a certain type. I mean, I think the best food is often, you know, a taco truck or that sushi hole in the wall or whatever. That's, that's kind of my idea of a great meal. But I think for this character to have these sort of really lush, sensual, not in the sense of sexual, but just Mm. in the sense of, of the senses experiences, in addition to all of her sexual experiences was a big part of her story. And she also sort of, I think, comes to appreciate colors more and visual beauty more in a subtle way as the story goes on. Yeah. And, you know, she has many encounters in this book, um, uh, satisfying all manner of appetite. And they're kind of like that change her perceptions or her, con- she has many consciousness altering events. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I would say. And, you know, like she does come out, you know, of some of them seeing things more vividly, for example, or perceiving things as she mightn't have before. Yeah, yeah. I really wanted her to go on this journey of like uh, awakening to life again. And so it's not so much a thing that is new as just opening your eyes to what is really around her all the time. It's interesting because like, of course, like a lot of in context, you know, I'm thinking altered consciousness, I'm thinking about drug use, but I also was, it just got me thinking a little bit about, you know, whether you know, the state of reading or to be reading or to be writing is a form of altered consciousness, which I would say yes. Absolutely. I mean, when you are, you know, a novelist and you were deep into the book, ideally you are in a somewhat disassociated state where the book that you are writing is as real to you as the lived reality you are experiencing. I think that is sort of the ideal place to be in writing. And it doesn't happen every day, but when it does happen, you're generally onto something good that even if you end up not using in the finished book will provide some clues to you as to what your story is and what it is that you need and want to accomplish here. Um, And as a reader, yeah, that's what I'm always looking for. And I do find it harder to find every year. I mean, if you go into reading a certain type of book, a classic or something a bit highbrow, you know, you're in for a challenge, you know, you're not in for that escapist experience. But I did want to read and do enjoy reading when I can find them something that is escapist uh, to that point of almost disassociation. And I guess that's a sort of different formula for everyone. But for me, the formula is fun, engaging, but also um, a plot that pulls you really through. Yeah, I go deep myself as a reader. Like the things I have agreed to unknowingly while I've been reading a really good book are many. <laughs> you mean like that you just sort of went along with it while you were reading yeah. it? or Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to return to the idea of a thriller, this is it's more than a thriller, an erotic thriller. Um, I wanted to explore the other word erotic. Um, do you write a lot of sex? Never. This is the only thing I've ever written that has any sex in it. Yeah, in my books. Yeah, I've done a little bit in my TV and film stuff, most of which has not been produced. Some more sexually explicit stuff in a book. No, that was one thing I wanted to do is like find a new challenge for myself. And I think writing about sex in an intelligent, thoughtful way is really, really hard. And I had never done it before, both because I had backed off from the challenge and because it would have been not as natural of a fit with my other books and stories and whatnot. So yeah. that was sort of a big uh, a challenge I set for myself and I hope I pulled off was writing about sex in a way that is neither juvenile nor pornographic nor strictly uh, titillating, but is really a part of this character and a part of her arc. Would you say to achieve that, that aim, that noble sex writing aim, you know, takes a uh, vulnerability or bravery? Um. Well, now maybe I should. <laughs> did I, <laughs> wait, I'll how, say it. <laughs> did, did I make myself more vulnerable than I realized here? Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> um, you know, part of that I think is is about getting old and I'm 50 mm. now. I turned 50 a couple weeks ago and I'm a lot less concerned about sort of vulnerability and, and am I going to look stupid and am I yeah. going to look weird? Are people going to think this is a sex act that I like because it's in the book? Yeah. And I also don't have the concerns I would have had when I was younger, like, is this going to lead to a lot of creepy people hitting on me? Maybe it'll lead to a couple creepy people hitting on me, but certainly not like you would expect as a younger woman. Right, right. 
I turned 40 this year myself, and I'm now, I'm pleasantly surprised by what I'm willing to say on air versus what I'd be willing to say, say, at 30, you know? And I find yeah, I can bring yeah. a lot more of myself to to this job, where before I was, like, trying to ask the right questions, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think part of it is that, you know, knowledge of yourself, knowledge of self, as many spiritual traditions call it, that you feel like you can, can be really honest, and and part of it is having established a point in your career where, like, Eh, if people don't like it, that's fine. Because <laughs> they don't like it. That's okay. I know who I am. I've got my career. It's okay. And part of it is knowing that that freedom from a certain type of consequence. Hmm. Freedom from a certain type of consequence. I'd like to use that as a segue to talking about Dreamland books. This is the first book you are publishing. You're a publisher now. Yes. Uh, it still sounds a little odd when you say it out loud. I'm like, me? <laughs> really? Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, you're a publisher what? now. <laughs> Congratulations. But, uh, hey. Thank you. Yeah, I got um, uh, my boxes of finished books yesterday, just in time, and it's wow. going to make it to bookstores in time. So I guess I can say, yes, I am a publisher now. I wasn't entirely sure until yesterday afternoon. <laughs> but the books got here. They look good. Uh, you know, all the words are in the right place as far as I can tell. Yeah, yeah, looking good so far. Why did you choose your own work to to set sail with? Um, that was a very easy decision because I knew I would make a lot of mistakes and I wanted to make them <laughs> on myself first. Uh, so hopefully, I, I still i am not sure I'm ready to publish someone else yet. The book has mm -hmm. yet to come out. And, uh, you know, after a couple months, I will do a sort of a, a tabulation of what I got right and what I got wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, none of the wrong things show up in the finished book, I hope. But I get right. myself a lot of stress with scheduling things wrong and doing the one thing when I should have done the other thing first and my yeah. workflow and all of that stuff that I... I'm not used to thinking about, but it was fun to to think about things I don't usually think about. That was one reason of many why I did it was to sort of use a different part of my brain. Like distribution, supply chain, et cetera, logistics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Womp, up, womp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With all of those problems this year, I ended up doing print on demand for the book, which has oh, been yeah. both better cool. and worse than I thought it would be. Um, it looks really good. So that's nice because print on demand doesn't always. It looks great takes a little longer to print and ship than I hoped it would. But I knew that not only would taking on the printing be a challenge for me in any circumstance, and I talked to a couple distributors and they were fine, but they didn't have quite the same publishing program that I wanted to do. I wanted the freedom that came with doing it all myself. And yeah. I wanted to get space at a printer, <laughs> which I would not do <laughs> if I had not done print on demand with all of the printing and paper and cardboard shortages this year, I would have been seriously screwed if I had gone any other route. Because if, if, all the big publishers are struggling for printer time. Where would that leave me? Even though it's not perfect, it was the right solution for this book. I'm really glad I went in that direction. It might lead to some shipping delays, but less shipping delays than the than the books being not printed at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Also, speaking of like content wise, I was wondering like you know, how, you know, this is an, an erotic literary thriller and so much more. This is a book of <laughs> many delights. And I Thank was thinking you. about like how, how it would be ruined if on, on a path through traditional publishing, you know, how it might be. And maybe that's being ungenerous. Maybe there are traditional publishers who would have handled it with care, but. That was a big consideration. You know, I'd yeah. always wanted to start my own publishing company. I had always wanted to do exactly what I'm doing, which is publishing my own books and then hopefully other people's books as well. You know, the long-term goal is to publish a couple books a year and do them really, really well. And again, start with my own and make all the mistakes on myself, but then eventually publish other people too. But when I finished this book, I realized I didn't want to give it to a big publisher. That dream of starting my own press was always in the future, in the future. Someday I'll do it. Someday I'll do it. And then with this book, I was like, uh, it's not going to get better with an editor. It's just not. I have books that desperately need an editor. Mm -hmm. uh, my next book in my detective series, I've already told my my British publisher, I'm still working with traditional publishers in all my European markets. I was like, I really am going to need you to edit this. It's not going to work the same way this book worked. But this book, the story was, again, it's a thriller. It's a straightforward, we're looking for the thing. Do we get the thing? And I felt like an editor would take out a lot of the things that make it work. Uh, and there would be a lot of weirdness around the sex. It would either be like, put in more sex and make it a real work of erotica or take out some of the sex because we think it's weird or mm -hmm. one thing that comes up a lot and it's the same with screenwriting it's the same with any form of writing if you write something that makes your editor your exec your whoever you're answering to at that moment uncomfortable mm. it's really hard for them to see through to the reader's point of view and it's like 
the reader is reading this of the privacy of their own home. They're not going to sit in a sales meeting and talk about female ejaculation. <laughs> that I right. understand would be a challenge for you. <laughs> I have to do it in yeah. TV meetings now and actually say those words to other people in public, which is trying, mm -hmm. but uh, it's my own fault. But <laughs> but uh, what readers look for are looking for, and I knew as a reader, this was a book that I would want to read, um, is not always what uh, our beloved executives and editors are looking for. You hardly, if you still take the subway, you hardly see covers anymore anyway, even, you know, there's even more privacy for readers now. You've got the e-reader, you know, a lot oh, of yeah. us are confined to the home. So it's like, yeah, think about it, execs. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I just did not feel like this book would benefit from going through that whole process. So that was a big part of the decision. I felt like there would be either an attempt to push it in a more marketable direction or an attempt to sort of water it down. Um, having been through the process many times, I, I felt pretty confident that it was not right for this book. I have a, a big question I'd like to ask you as a publisher, and I don't, I don't really know if it's fair, but what, what, makes book, what makes a book fail? You mean in terms of sales or in terms of uh, artistic? Art. Yeah, artistically. <sighs> that is a hard question. Um, yeah. I mean, as a writer, I can answer it better than as okay. a publisher. Okay, think, let's switch hats. Let's do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I should get hats. Uh, so far, it's just one <laughs> one very muddled skull in here. Um, I think often what makes it fail is structure, mm. which is a very prosaic answer. That is a very uh, uh, unintellectual answer. But I do think in this particular moment in time, uh, a lot of people send me thrillers and mysteries and horror novels to read. And often there is a lack of understanding of um, how the big picture works. You mm -hmm. read a lot of books now with great scenes and great pages and great chapters, but the overall structure is not holding together in a way that really propels you or whatever the effect is. Of course, you don't always want propulsion, maybe right. whatever the effect is that you want. I think another thing that can make books fail is fear. And you often have, I'll give you two sort of opposite answers now. One is fear okay. of, um, again, like I just said, with this book, I wanted to go to sort of certain places with it that I thought might make other people uncomfortable. Yeah. So the fear of that is, it holds people back sometimes from doing their best work. On the other hand, uh, it sounds contradictory, but I don't think it is. People don't know how to edit themselves. I was just talking about this to a, uh, a young friend yesterday who was an aspiring writer who I was like, you can learn how to edit yourself. I turn in very polished manuscripts, even when mm -hmm. I do go the traditional, normal publishing route and work with editors, I tend to turn in very finished manuscripts. Not always, not always. Yeah. There's exceptions. Yeah. But you just got to keep going with that self-editing and somehow not use it to water your work down, but somehow use it to heighten what is unique to you. Hmm. Excellent point. I mean, and th this is really drawing to the forefront of my mind the, you know, the the resource of time, though, and the time and care that takes to achieve. Well, yeah, that was yet again another reason to start my own uh, publishing company was it is, uh, you know, one way that, that big publishers have found to sell books, which is a good way, it works, is to publish more frequently. And so there is always going to be the assumption that that's what you, the writer, want, because who wouldn't want to sell as many books as possible? So there's a big, um, I mean, there's no pressure on me. No one fucking cares what I do. My books don't sell that well, <laughs> but in general, in the business, <laughs> there is a lot of pressure on writers to publish a book every two years. And I will say, like I was saying before, I often want to just pick up, uh, the equivalent of an airport novel, but a higher grade airport novel, something that is fun and engaging. And there's a lot of writers and a lot of series who are sort of in that thriller fun genre mm -hmm. I used to like. And their books have gotten worse and worse and worse as that one book every year, every two years pressure has mounted up. You know, what's kind of remarkable now I'm remembering this. I was kind of between places when I acquired this book and I, we were setting up the interview and I was reading it. But, you know, whenever I mentioned that I was going to interview you, my friends were like, oh, yeah, she's amazing. I'm a, like, I'm a fan. And they were like passionate fans. And I interview all stripes of authors, you know, debut to the most famous. And I got the most reactions out of you. Um, that is so nice. I heard that from someone the other day, too. Yeah? I did another interview yeah. for this book and, and uh, it was with another writer. And we mentioned some people we know in common. And he was like, 
They're all such fans of yours. I am. I have this very old fashioned career that doesn't really exist for other writers anymore <laughs> in this place of like cult writer or a, a critic's darling writer or writer's writer or all of these expressions that young people won't even know because those categories don't exist anymore for anyone but me. I just got incredibly fortunate because I don't have a huge fan base. None of my books have even come close to the bestseller list. But the fans that I do have are, you know, wonderfully passionate. And it's been an incredibly surprising experience. It's not something I ever expected. And it's been really wonderful. And I'm just grateful to every single one of them. Lily, in the book of The Most Precious Substance, has that going on a little bit herself. And it opens doors. She does. She does. And it was, you know, that part of the book was very autobiographical. You know, I had been dealing with a lot of death and illness in my own family and my own life and doing a lot of caregiving and and not quite as depressed as she was, but it's hard work and it is hard to remember that you have another life, that people know who you are and people remember who you are when you have spent years kind of uh, helping people bathe and, and, and changing diapers and dealing with the doctor's appointments and all that. It's really rough. So that was somewhat autobiographical for sure. This idea that she goes back out in the world as I sort of am with this book and people are like, oh, I remember you. I have just, you know, been waiting to hear you, hear from you. So that that's been really a, a lovely mirroring of life in the book. Yeah. And Lily's experience in the book also reminds us, you know, that it, it's an all too common phenomenon that when, you know, we're encountering these very hard times in our lives, you know, caregiving, grief, loss, that sometimes people feeling awkward can scatter. Sometimes our nearest and dearest who we, we would have always thought to rely on. And this book makes it pretty clear. Don't do that, guys. Uh, I'm so glad you got that from the book because I hate to think of having like messages in the book. I don't right. like that idea of like a message in a novel, but I do like the idea of themes and just reflecting actual things that have happened to me on occasion. And yeah. that is an actual thing that happens for sure. Uh, when I, you know, entered this difficult period with a number of family members getting ill, a couple of friends just totally dropped me, like just never heard from them again. And I was like, thought, I stupidly thought we were still friends and would text them and be like, hey, it took me a long time to realize we're not friends anymore because my life is not glamorous and exciting at the moment. Um, and there is a childishness in the way uh, I kind of hate when people bash on America because it's so easy and, and, and trite to do. But I will say there is this unique thing in American culture, especially in the kind of white upper middle class American culture that I come from. And despite all of my many travels, I've ended up back in <laughs> somehow. <laughs> um, there is a fear of death and a fear of bodily care and a fear of responsibility towards other human beings. Um, and of course, you know, any human being from any culture can experience that. Right. But we do seem to have a slightly... There is a childishness in that point of view. That's what I will say. This idea that I'm never going to be in that situation. I'm never going to grow old or my parents will never die. Mm. Um, and to hear to encounter that from people in my age range of 50 is is a bit shocking and disappointing. But the the opposite is true too, that people will, will come through for you and people will be there for you who you did not expect. And the people who have turned out to sort of really be there for me through all of this are are not always the people I would have expected, you know, if you had told me five or 10 years ago. So there's a lot of good to be found in these situations too. And of course, as hard as caring for others is, there is a, a, a joy and a privilege in it as well. Absolutely. Ooh, I care for the characters in this book. I'm <laughs> so grateful to you for the experience of reading it. And I just want to ask by way of wrapping up, is there anything else you'd like our listeners to know about the book or any thoughts to finish off our conversation today? Um, one of my secret hopes for the books is it will make people have better sex. So that's, ah! a, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there is a, a specific sex act in the book that a lot of people who have read it told me they didn't know existed before. So now <gasps> that you know, go out there, give it the good old college try. If you've got that particular set of equipment, have fun with it. It's okay if it doesn't happen. You will not regret trying. And uh, I hope you enjoy it and have the same fun escapist experience reading that I had writing it. I strongly believe our listeners will. I did one more time. Big thank you, Sarah, for joining me today on Fully Booked. Thank you so much, Megan. This was really fun. That was Sarah Graham, author of the book of The Most Precious Substance, out now from Dreamland Books. After the break, we'll ask our editors for their top picks and books for the week. You're listening to Fully Booked by Kirkus Reviews. 
Luann Smith is the editor of Taboos and Transgressions, an anthology of short stories about breaking the rules, whatever they may be. Our reviewer called it, quote, a fine and varied collection that gives eloquent voice to the unsayable, end quote. It was one of Kirkus Indy's best books of 2021, and in this sponsored interview, we'll talk to Luann about the anthology. My name is Amelia, and I work in the indie department. Hi, Luann. Thank you so much for joining us on Fully Booked. You've worked both as an editor and a professor in addition to your own writing. How does being the editor of a work like this differ from being a writer? Well, I bring a lot of the skills from being a writer to the to the job of uh, being an editor. Working with other people's work probably relates more to my teaching than it does my own writing in that I'm, I'm reading and assessing and trying to figure out something needs to be changed or if everything's okay. It's a little closer to reading a lot of material like I used to do with my students. This anthology, which deals with uh, taboos and, you know, these kinds of illicit things, both like on a, on a legal level, a cultural level, and a personal level. What drew you to this theme? And I guess, why now? So it's a very correct time. You know, we, we're uh, in, a, in a time frame now where Everybody seems to be judging each other a little bit. And, and uh, um, I always like pieces that I read usually are a little bit down and dirty, as I say in the interview, and people aren't behaving themselves. <laughs> and so what got me into this particular subject actually had to do with uh, taking a master class online um, that Joyce Carol Oates was hosting. And she has a segment in that particular master class has focused on taboos. And I started thinking, what a great idea for an anthology to pull together stories that have to do with breaking taboos. And something I thought was interesting that you mentioned is that when you put out the call for submissions, you got a lot more from women writers and that they touched on perhaps a broader range of subject matter. Uh, why do you think that is? There may very, really, very seriously be more rules that women adhere to uh, or try to adhere to, uh, more f- expectations from society or family we try to live up to as women. And, and so I think that the women really tapped in on, on a subject that interested them. And the men that submitted, submitted certainly some really interesting and, and good stories. What it said to me was that the men had a freer sense of their themselves and their lives uh, than the women did. Whether readers of uh, taboos and transgressions are men or women, whether they're you know American or not, whatever their own perception of what is taboo or not, uh, what do you hope they take from this anthology? That it's very complicated. Taboos uh, we think are are cut and dried, and that you do it or you don't do it or whatever it may be. But I think it's a lot more complicated than that. And I I want them to take away from this, the human aspect of it and how complicated it can be. And sometimes you even need to break the rules. You you take risks when you break taboos. But I think that just seeing it as a a black and white issue that, um, you know, is so cut and dried is is not how it actually is. And I'm hoping that readers take away this sense of complication. Uh, when it uh, comes to the idea of taboos and what they are in our world and in our lives. If you're just joining us on the podcast, you can find Taboos and Transgressions online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Bookshop. The ultimate insider scoop on the latest books, right here on Fully Booked. We're joined now by our editors with their top picks in books for the week. We have Young Readers editors Laura Simeon and Summer Edward, nonfiction editor Eric Liebertrau, and fiction editor Lori Muchnick. Starting with Laura, what is your choice for us? So my choice for this week is I Must Betray You, which is the latest from Ruta Sepedes, who is known and loved for specializing in historical fiction about pivotal, exciting moments in history that are often um, lesser known. Um, And this one's no exception. It's set in Romania in 1989. So at the end of almost a quarter century of Ceausescu's regime, 
when, you know, Romanians are living in extreme poverty and surveillance that was just mind boggling, you know, even by, you know, standards of life behind the Iron Curtain. And so the main character is Christian. He's a um, teenage boy who, he, in a lot of ways, he's like many teenage boys everywhere. He's There's a girl he has a crush on who he's trying to get to know. His grandfather's sick and he's worried about him. But the, the situation he's living in is so exceptional. And through his mother, who's a cleaner for the family, uh, this family of American diplomats, um, he gets to know a teenage boy from the U.S., which leads to basically he 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 ends up on the radar of the secret police and is essentially threatened into or bribed into becoming um, an informant. And so it's that question of you know who who would you betray and at what cost? You know if if someone's promising medicine that could help save your grandfather's life, is that enough to betray the trust of everybody around you? And it's you know Sepedi is she's known for doing meticulous research on the ground. She interviewed people in Romania who lived through this time period and in you know pivotal roles in the government and regular people. And she has this knack for seamlessly blending all this historical information into the narrative. And so you feel like you are there. The atmosphere is so vivid. And it's just, it's such a page turner. And our reviewer wrote, the last line will leave readers gasping. And that is true. But don't don't sneak ahead and read the last line. You have to read it from the beginning. Oh, that's great, Laura. I love that, um, that recommendation. It sounds pretty intense. Um, you know, although it's been a little over, um, I would say, 30 years since the fall of communism in Romania and um, in Central and Eastern Europe, more broadly speaking, you know, there are still a lot of open wounds. And I think that reading stories about the experiences of people who lived through that difficult era is one pathway to healing. You know, many Romanians who were teenagers uh, during that period and who witnessed the revolution of December of 1989 are now in their 50s, uh, like Sepedis herself. And um, I imagine that a lot of them are now looking back on their lives and grappling with their recollections and searching for a sense of closure, if that's at all possible. I want to mention another book called Red Sky, Memoir of a Childhood in Communist Romania by Heya Lea Molnar. It was a Bank Street Best uh, Children's Book of the Year in 2011, and it would be a great read-alike match for your selection, Laura. And that one sounds great. Thanks. Sure. Laura's pick for the week is I Must Betray You by Ruta Sepetis. Thank you, Laura, for that choice. Next, we've got Summer. Summer, what have you chosen for us? So my choice for this week is Pow Wow Day um, by Tracy Sorrell. Uh, in this story, a young girl with the beautiful name River is recovering from an, an unspecified illness. Um, but powwow day is coming up, and she really wants to uh, join her friends and family in the grand entry procession. So on the day of the event, uh, she bravely dons her jingle dress, which is a type of regalia that uh, Native American girls and women wear when performing a traditional healing dance known as the jingle dress dance. Um, but when the time arrives for the performance of this dance, because of the, um, you know, the ravages of her illness, River doesn't really feel connected to the dance. Um, you know, the text says that she can't feel the drum's heartbeat. Um, but fortunately, she has a friend who kindly offers to dance for her. And, um, you know, all the river just ends up watching the performance. By the end of the story, she can feel her spirit beginning to revive and her, uh, her vitality, I guess, returning. You know, one of the things I learned when I was editing Kirkus's review of this book is that powwows are not Native American ceremonies. For some reason, I had concluded that they were ceremonial ga gatherings, but they're actually traditional social gatherings, which is quite different. Traditional medicine and, um, you know, non-Western therapies are a great interest of mine, which is a part of the reason I absolutely love this picture book. My own picture book debut 
Um, the Wonder of the World Leaf is a story about a young Trinidadian girl who uses the traditional healing practices of Trinidad and Tobago and draws upon the support of the community to help her ill grandmother heal. So I would like to humbly offer my picture book <laughs> as a read-alike. <laughs> Another great read-alike is the picture book um, Tashi and the Tibetan Flower Cure by Naomi C. Rose, which is about a young Tibetan American girl who uh, helps her grandfather recover from an illness through the use of a traditional Tibetan cure um, that also requires the participation of her entire community. So, um, yeah, great books. Summer, if you want to learn more about powwows as a social event, I don't know if you know the novel There There by Tommy Orange. It came out a few years ago. Um, it's a really excellent novel about Native American uh, community in Oakland, California. And the whole structure of the novel is following a variety of people in the community as they get ready for the, the big Oakland powwow, which is, you know, the big social event of the year. So it's a really great book. That sounds like a great recommendation, Laurie. Um, I particularly like that it's about urban uh, Native Americans because I feel like they're, uh, um, you know, un underrepresented, I guess, in in literature yeah. in general. Yeah, so. absolutely. That was um, exactly what, you know, all the reviews said and what everybody said when the book came out, that this was showing a totally different aspect of Native American life at the moment. yeah. And it's a, it's short stories, you say, it's or is it a novel? It's a novel, but um, it follows a number of different characters. So each chapter is, I'm, try, I'm just trying to think, I read it, you know, four or five years ago. Each chapter is follows one character. So they're, they're almost like short stories, but then they, they all lead up to, you know, following the characters as they get ready for the powwow. Oh, cool. Yeah, that sounds great. Summer's pick for the week is Pow Wow Day by Tracy Sorrell, illustrated by Madeline Goodnight. Thank you so much, Summer, for that choice. Next, we have nonfiction. Eric, what have you chosen for us? I chose a book called Chasing History, A Kid in the Newsroom. It's a journalistic memoir by Carl Bernstein. Um, of course, everyone knows him as Bob Woodward's partner, who reported on the Watergate conspiracy, and they went on to write um, All the President's Men in 1974. And since then, you know, he's been a reporter for the Washington Post and also a commentator for um, a few different TV news networks and some other publications. Uh, but he hasn't written as many books. Woodward, of course, has written books about the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, and Trump as well. Um, so Bernstein has been kind of quiet on the book front. It's his first book in what, 15 years. He wrote a biography of Hillary Clinton in 2007, and this one is a look back on his entire life, um, mostly focused on his coverage of politics in Washington for the Washington Post. And so it's a really good kind of classic journalism memoir from a time where our reviewer actually calls it a political past unriven by political tribalism. And while that may, may not be entirely true, it is. it was certainly a different time. Um, certainly in politics, but also in the journalists who were covering them. Um, and so uh, Bernstein was basically all over Washington as his beat. And he, you know, got to know countless politicians and people in Washington. And this is the kind of book that, you know, anybody, any political junkie will love, but it's also kind of a, a refreshing, nostalgic view of a time when um, our like journalistic landscape wasn't so saturated and not quite as venomous as well. Um, of course, there's also plenty of plenty of stuff about Watergate, and there's some parallels to some of the you know um, some of the things that happened during the Trump administration as well. So it's not just a look back; it's kind of a timely timely book as well. Uh, and I think it's if people have read memoirs of Joseph, Joseph Mitchell and um, people like that. This is the kind of book I think that they would enjoy as well. So, Eric, I was wondering if you go by YA, um, I know we're lamenting a lot of the loss of adult journalism, but in the YA mm -hmm. sphere, there's quite a few like fiction and nonfiction books about journalism. And I wondered, 
because this book, it seems like it talks about his childhood and his teen years and he was getting started. Do you think this would have crossover appeal for teen readers? Yeah, I do. I think for hot, like uh, older age teen readers, um, I think there's there's plenty to learn because there's a lot of, of course, American history embedded in that and a lot of things that you didn't necessarily learn in textbooks as well. Um, so he and he also has some really good sections on uh, desegregation and a lot of the racial turmoil that kind of has plagued DC for many decades. Uh, so I think it's instructive in a lot of different ways. So yeah, 16, 17, 18 year olds, I think it might be great. Great. And definitely more exciting than a textbook. I think. Yes, for sure. Eric's pick for the week is Chasing History, A Kid in the Newsroom by Carl Bernstein. Thank you, Eric, for that pick. And finally, we have fiction. Lori, what have you chosen for us? I have um, a book called Mouth to Mouth by Antoine Wilson, which is a really just like a not very long and propulsive novel. It's about it's like a story within a story. It's got a really interesting narrative voice. The narrator, whose name we don't know, is a sort of not that successful novelist. He's sitting in John F. Kennedy Airport. He's just taken in a red eye from L.A. He's flying to Berlin, where he's then going to get a train to Frankfurt. No, the other way around. He's flying to Frankfurt. He's going to get a train to Berlin because he has this idea that he's kind of a cult novelist in Berlin, and maybe he'll, you know, be a little more successful there. So he's just going for a week to hope to get some interviews and stuff. So he's kind of a sad, sad character. And as he's sitting in the airport, his plane is delayed. His whole trip is really, you know, annoying and uncomfortable sitting in coach and red eye and stuff. And he sees um, someone who was an acquaintance of his at college 20 years ago, looking extremely successful, suit, you know, sharp haircut. And he says hello to him. The guy's name is Jeff Cook. And they reconnect. And Jeff invites our narrator to go with him to sit in the first class lounge where he will be waiting for the delayed plane. And when they sit down, Jeff just starts telling the narrator the story of his life. He said, you know, oh, it's funny that you're here because something that happened right after we graduated from college changed my life. And I'm going to tell you this story. So he was at the beach one day. He saw a man who looked like he was drowning. He went, no one else was around. He went in, he rescued this man. He gave him CPR paramedics came, took the man away. The man never knew who he was, but he became interested in what happened to this man. You know, he had saved his life. What kind of life had he saved? So he, you know, he finds out who he was and he, he was an art dealer who was extremely successful. So Jeff starts kind of hanging around the art gallery, trying to get to know him, figure out what he's like, you know, not really intending to insinuate himself into his life, but just, you know, decide whether he did a good thing by saving this man's life, like what repercussions would it would it have? But sort of one thing leads to another and he ends up getting a job in the gallery. They need a receptionist and he, you know, insinuates himself more and more into the life of this man whose life he saved, but who, who doesn't know he saved his life. And so he's just telling the story to the narrator and, you know, long periods will go by where it's just, you know, you'll just hear his story and then a new chapter will begin and you'll have the narrator and Jeff having some dialogue, getting some free drinks and food in the lounge. And it's all sort of stories within stories. And, you know, you're trying to figure out whose version you can trust and, you know, what's the relationship between the two of these kind of narrators. And, you know, so the story itself is really kind of fun and interesting and a bit of a thriller where you're trying to figure out what's going to happen. How did we get to this point? But also like, there's a lot to think about, about, you know, narrative and, and truthfulness and, and, and it just goes by really fast. I, I recommend it highly. Thanks for that, Lori. I, I noticed in the review and a couple other reviews, they talk about how like the, the last paragraph or the last sentence kind of like flips a lot of what you found before. And I'm always interested about how people end novels. For me, you know, a lot of people will consider if they don't like the end of the novel, they'll just say they don't like the entire book. And I've never been that way, but I, I'm also very fascinated by this idea of kind of you know, a twist that happens at the absolute end of the novel. Um, 
So it, you know, it kind of what it harkens to what, what Laura was saying about not turning to the last page. I feel like I want to, but it sounds like <laughs> I should stick around for the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I often kind of page ahead and yeah. kind of, cause I, I sort of like to know what's going to happen and then I can enjoy yeah. more how we get there. But I managed e- even despite having, edited that review I managed to keep myself from looking at the last page of this book and it you know it was it was better that way it was definitely okay yeah yeah <laughs> well good for you and your discipline uh, I'll have to do the same thing <laughs> If this sounds intriguing to you listeners, remember to flip back uh, through our archives in January. I had the pleasure of speaking with Antoine Wilson about Mouth to Mouth, and it was a very juicy conversation. And I'll say, Lori, that last line was working for me. I was like, "Flip flip the switch. Yeah, totally. Lori's book for the week is Mouth to Mouth by Antoine Wilson. Thank you so much for that choice. Well, that does it for another episode of Fully Booked. Thank you all so much for joining us. Please join us again next week when my guest will be Charmaine Wilkerson, the debut author of Black Cake, a novel in which two estranged siblings receive a rather remarkable inheritance. I'll say no more for now. Looking forward to that chat next week. But until then, you know what to do. Turn this thing off and go read a book. Thanks for listening to Fully Booked by Kirkus Reviews. Check out new episodes every Tuesday at podcastone.com, on the Podcast One app, or you can subscribe on iTunes. Enjoy basketball, soccer, and all your favorite sports like never before at BetMGM. Sign up using bonus code JERSEY and your first wager is risk-free up to $1,000. Plus, when you register with BetMGM, you'll get instant access to a variety of parlay selection features, live betting options, player props, and daily boosted odds specials. Download the BetMGM app today or go to BetMGM.com and enter bonus code JERSEY and place your first wager risk-free up to $1,000. Now you're winning with the king of sportsbooks. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. 21 years of age or older to wager. New Jersey only. New customer offer. All promotions are subject to qualification and eligibility requirements. Rewards issued as non-withdrawable free bets or site credit. Free bets expire seven days from issuance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hi, I'm Flo from Progressive. Being a baseball fanatic like me can be stressful. It's not all sports points and touchdowns. So Progressive is going to help you take your mind off your team for a moment. Instead of thinking about how they missed that goal point score, think about the Name Your Price tool from Progressive letting you choose coverage options based on your budget. Unlike your team that missed the end zone net area. Well, anyway, hope this distraction about Progressive's Name Your Price tool was helpful. It sure kept me from thinking about all those penalty balls. Yay, sports! Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law.